thanks so much for joining everyone. Um, I see some familiar faces from my trainee group. Hello. And um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Camille Marcotte. Um, normally I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension, but today I'm here in my Master Naturalist trainee role, which is really exciting. So I'm going to share my screen so you all can see my presentation. So I'm going to talk about IMAP invasives and um, hopefully actually share my screen so you can see the app actually in action and live. Um, but I'm first going to start talking a little bit about invasive species. Um, most of you probably know, um, I know we had a presentation on invasives at our um, training session, but I'm just going to kind of set the context a little bit for why IMAP invasives is so cool and so important. And then I'll actually get into how to use it and we can kind of play around with creating an account and all of that fun stuff. And then I'll also mention some volunteer opportunities that I know about um, in case you guys are interested in getting involved and using that for your Master Naturalist um, hours. So I wanna make this a little bit interactive just because it's seven o'clock at night and um, I don't know about you guys, but I just ate dinner and so sometimes <laughs> I start to nod off a little bit. So just to keep us all really engaged, um, I'm going to do a poll. So I don't know if you all have used poll everywhere before, um, but basically you just type in this link and I'll also put it in the chat so you guys can click on it there. Um, but you're going to go to that link and um, or you can text if you have your smartphone out and you're not using it for Zoom, um, or if you're able to kind of navigate between that, you basically can text this um, Camille Marco 338 to this number and then text A, B, C, or D, and I'll share the poll now so you guys can kind of see it. Um, but let me know if you guys are having trouble navigating. And then once you navigate to this or once you have this text message, just keep it open because we'll use it a couple more times. So I'm going to move over to the poll now so you all can see that. There we go. So these are the choices. So what is an invasive species? Take your best guess. I'm guessing you all probably know, but Sometimes people get a little tripped up. So it looks like everyone so far has entered B. You can also put your guests in the chat if that's easier too. If you're having a little bit of trouble navigating to the poll everywhere, I know sometimes it can be a little cumbersome. But I'll just give it another second or so. It looks like so far, I can't tell how many people have responded, but 100% of people who have responded, maybe it's only one person, have guessed B. Matt and Linda are saying B. You all are correct. B is the answer. So I'm going to go back to PowerPoint. So what are invasive species? You guys got it right. It's a non-native plant, animal, insect, or pathogen that can cause harm to the environment, economy, and or human health. So um, some of the examples on the slide are in the middle, we have giant hogweed, which is an invasive plant that can actually cause burns to people's skin, um, just causes light sensitivity, which just causes you to get burned. Um, so obviously that causes um, impacts to human health. Um, on the left, there's hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which is an aphid-like um, critter that actually creates these woolly sacs on the hemlock trees and it actually ends up killing them. Um, so hemlock trees are really beneficial. They provide a lot of ecosystem services and they're just beautiful to look at. Um, so that causes, you know, impacts to the environment, the economy and human health. Um, and on the right is the emerald ash borer. So similar to the hemlock woolly adelgid, but the ash borer just kills ash trees. So again, a lot of impacts, negative impacts to um, the environment. 
Um, also the economy, ash trees are really good for different products. And so, um, as you can see, invasives can cause a lot of damage and negative impacts. So why should we care? I've talked about this a little bit already, but um, invasive species can cause habitat degradation and loss. So on the bottom left is hemlock mortality. The Great Smoky Mountains has or had a lot of hemlock trees, um, but you can kind of see these little gray hemlocks that have died off and create what they call gray ghosts trees because they look kind of ghosts and sickly and, and you know, dead trees. Doesn't look like the beautiful lush green that you think of with hemlocks. Um, they can also cause a loss of native fish, wildlife, and tree species. So again, um, hemlock will indulge in killing off hemlock trees. Um, and uh, they can also, you know, contribute to native fish and wildlife dying off as well. Uh, loss of recreational opportunities and income. So tourism here in the Finger Lakes is really, really, you know, huge economic um, driver for the communities. And you can see on the bottom right, there's a hydrilla infestation. So I don't know if you've ever seen hydrilla or an aquatic invasive similar to hydrilla, like water chestnut that kind of creates these thick mats on a water body and just make it completely impossible to really enjoy yourself um, you know, swimming or boating through them. Um, I've tried to swim through water chestnut and it's, you know, you're getting all tangled up in the water chestnut. And, you know, if you're trying to canoe or kayak on hydrilla, it's like, you might as well be kayaking on a lawn. Like it's just a really thick mat. Um, and then can also cause crop damage and diseases in humans and livestock. So we'll talk about spotted lanternfly really quickly, which can cause a lot of crop damage. So why should we care? Well, hemlocks are a really good species to kind of highlight why we should care so much. They're a keystone species. They play a really critical role um, ecologically. Um, they provide shade that keeps soil from drying out, but also because they grow in these steep ravines and next to streams, they provide shade for um, the water, which is really great for fish species. On a hot day, we like to escape you know, the, the sun and so fish like to do that as well. So they provide some cool habitat for critters. Um, they also provide wind and snow protection. And again, because they grow next to streams, they're really great for um, erosion control and helping to prevent nutrient loading to our streams and water bodies. They live a really long time um, when they're not infected with hemlock woolly adulgid. Um, they can positively affect property values because they are so beautiful and they do provide natural stream stabilization. And then the loss of hemlock trees um, will really alter our forest structure, especially here in New York and the Northeast. And so a lot of researchers are currently looking at, you know, what might replace hemlocks? Is there anything that we can do now um, to kind of plant or, you know, think about what might be replacing hemlocks? So that's some research that's going on right now. So now we're gonna go back to the poll and um, I'm asking you guys, how much do you think invasives cost the US per year to control? So I'm gonna go back to the polls so I can activate this one. All right, so guesses, you can also put it in the chat. How much do you think invasive species costs the US per year to control? Oh, interesting, we're at 50-50, okay, 60-40. Nobody's picked C or D. Gail says 1 billion. So actually the answer is C. So whoever just pressed C, you are correct. It's actually 120 billion. Um, some people think that it's actually more, but that's just what I was able to find from the USDA. Um, but it could very well be more. Um, that's just what I was able to find online. 
Um, so in my job, I actually like to think about water quality and in invasive species. Um, so invasives can also have impacts on water quality. They can change um, aquatic ecosystems, again, with the loss of hemlocks that can lose a lot of shade that was provided to waterways that fish really benefit from. Um, different invasive fish can really um, kill off other fish species. Um, and there's a lot of research that's come out recently and is still currently being explored about the role that um, invasive mussels like zebra and quagga mussels may play the role they may play in harmful algae blooms um, and just the way that they kind of filter nutrients and, um, you know, with their excretion, some of the nutrients that they're excreting, how that might contribute to harmful algae blooms. So that's really, really interesting. And I highly recommend you guys check out some of that research if you're interested. So what are the characteristics of invasives? Um, they have high fecundity. So basically they reproduce really quickly and have lots of babies and they grow really quickly. Um, they also tend to have earlier um, leaf out so they can kind of um, outcompete native species in accessing sunlight and nutrients. They're really aggressive and they're generalist so they can kind of eat anything, whereas some native species prefer one specific plant or um, one specific type of um, insect. They're really effective at dispersing, so aquatic plants are able to disperse and reproduce in many different ways. So just fragments, they might have seed pods that they also produce, um, and it makes them really easy to move around. Because they didn't evolve here, they have no natural predators or diseases that really kind of control their populations. Uh, often they have little to no nutritional value for species. So I remember Hillary talking about how invasives are kind of the potato chips um, in terms of not having any nutritional value. And so species might fill up on an invasive species and feel full, but not really be getting the nutrients they need. Um, they can reduce or degrade habitat or food for native species. Um, like I mentioned before, they can kind of eat off or kill off habitat that a native species needs. They're really adaptable to the environment and they've been listed as one of the six main threats to biodiversity. So how did invasives get here? Um, sometimes intentionally or unintentionally, um, a lot of times landscaping companies and nurseries are still selling invasives. Um, sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. Um, food crops is another way and just our kind of global trade overall. Um, this year, earlier this year in March, um, a lot of people were finding moss balls that they were getting from aquarium stores that were infested with zebra mussels. So, you know, invasives can kind of make na national news as well. Um, so that was kind of a recent one of a spreading of zebra mussels. Um, ballast water, boats and watercraft is another way, which is why a lot of lakes have boat stewards. And they can hitchhike on us as people, so our boots or firewood, we can kind of spread them around as well. So what are some ways we can prevent invasives from, from spreading? Let me go back to the poll. So what do you guys think? What are some things that we can all do to prevent invasive species from spreading? D, yeah, everyone says D, you're right. So yeah, we can use boot brushes. We can make sure our boats are clean, drained and dry and make sure we're purchasing firewood locally. Um, so this is the invasion curve. Um, I know Hillary showed this in her presentation, um, but it kind of just talks about why um, time is really important and how it plays a role in the cost of controlling invasives and why tracking invasive species is so important through using things like IMAP invasives. Um, the easiest thing to do is before a species is even there, it's you know, just education, letting people know 
and having them keep an eye out. Um, once a species is there, it's you know, in small enough populations that we might be able to eradicate it. And so again, that's when tracking plays a role. We wanna know where it is so that there, if there are small populations, we can get rid of them. But over time, the area infested kind of increases. And so we can only focus on containing it. Um, and eventually, um, as time goes on, the area infested increases so much that we're spending a lot more money just on kind of protecting our own assets. Maybe it's like in Skinny Atlas Lake, kind of having to protect the drinking water infrastructure from zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Um, you know, and they're actually spending millions of dollars to um, move some of the drinking water infrastructure um, deeper into the lake. Um, because of invasives and the harmful algae blooms, um, which invasives play a role in. So as you can see, it gets kind of more expensive. And so what we can do early on really plays a role um, in helping to kind of prevent, either eradicate or contain or prevent invasives from taking over. I wanted to highlight the DEC's ones to watch list. So this is from the Finger Lakes, but they have a list for um, several different regions in New York State. So you can kind of Google DEC's ones to watch and it'll pull up the list for your region. These are kind of the top. Um, I know in the Finger Lake it's, it's 11. I don't know if they have 11 for each region, but um, top 10 or so um, invasive species that the DEC is really encouraging people in that region to look out for. So I find this list really helpful because if I'm going out and about on a trail, you know, and looking for invasives, it can be overwhelming because there are so many and I'm constantly learning about new ones. So th these are kind of the top 11 that I'm like, okay, these are what I should take a look, you know, for when I'm out and about, like, do I see a hemlock tree? Let me check it for hemlock woolly adelgid or, um, you know, do I see any giant hogweed? Um, have I seen spotted lantern fly around anywhere? So kind of looking at the top ones to watch for your region can be really helpful. Um, these are some examples just to kind of get us thinking about invasives um, and common ones that we find throughout the state, um, just for some discussion later on. Um, so things like multiflora rose, garlic mustard is really common. Um, Phragmites, we have a huge patch of Phragmites at our office. Um, common buckthorn is one that I see so often out in the woods. Um, Tree of Heaven I have in my backyard. <laughs> Burning Bush um, and Norway Maple are all really, really common ones. Um, Spotted Lanternfly is one that the state is kind of on high alert for. Um, just because even though it primarily feeds on Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive, it also will attack grapes, um, hops, maple, fruit trees like apples. Um, they'll kind of go after um, like over 70 different plants. And that can have really devastating impacts to our forests and agricultural systems. Um, and so this is one that actually IMAP Invasives has a um, volunteer program for. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. But basically, they have these sucking mouth parts that when they're kind of sucking out from the tree or whatever, they will actually kind of excrete this honeydew, which then causes sooty molds, um, which can infect um, whatever they've landed on and started to feed on. Um, they're not very big. They're about an inch long as an adult. Um, and they lay these inch long egg masses that you can see in the upper right um, with this kind of like cracked mud like appearance. Um, they really like rusty metal to lay their eggs on. And so this is a good one to kind of look for year round because you can either look for the spotted lantern fly itself or you can look for the egg masses. So some resources before I get into the IMAP invasives are um, your PRISM. I encourage you all to reach out to your local PRISM. Um, they're great and have a lot of volunteer opportunities. The New York Invasive Species Research Institute has a lot of great information um, and they send out monthly digests of kind of quick research summaries. So you can kind of find out what's happening in the latest invasive species research without having to comb through and do a full literature review. Um, Cornell's weed resource is really great to see, is it a weed? Is it an invasive? You know, what exactly am I looking at? And so, same with Go Botany. 
Um, the USDA and DEC both have information on invasive species. Um, I prefer the DEC. I think it's just they have great fact sheets and it's a little bit easier to navigate. Um, the USDA is obviously more focused on ag-related invasive species. And then you can always check out the New York State list of prohibited and regulated invasive plants and animals um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about how the DEC manages invasives. So now we'll actually go into IMAP invasives. So if you've never heard of IMAP invasives before, um, it's basically a database where you can track and report um, invasive species. Um, you can also track if you didn't find an invasive species, but you went out to look for it. You can get alerts for um, early detection of species. So I get that for Hemlock Willie Adelgid in the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed for work because I wanna know kind of where it's spreading. It started on the west side of the lake and has kind of slowly made its way around the south and up into the east side now. So just trying to stay on top of that. Um, if you're part of an organization, you can um, actually track treatment and stuff if you're treating um, trees or anything like that. So there's a couple different types of data in here um, in IMAP Invasive. So you can track uh, presence if you found um, you know, tree of heaven, you could put it in as a point, or if you found a clump, you could do a polygon, or if you found it all along a trail, you could do it as a line. Um, not detected, so you could say, I searched this entire area, and I didn't find any um, hemlock leodelgid treatment. You could say, I searched this entire area, and I found hemlock leodelgid in this little patch, and I treated all of these hemlock trees. Um, and then searched area is just kind of the base record to all of the other ones that you're inputting. It's basically where you looked for everything. So there's a couple different roles. Um, there's the whole system, which is managed by NatureServe, which runs the whole software. Then there's a jurisdiction. So in New York, um, our jurisdiction is managed by the New York Nat Natural Heritage Program. Um, they're the ones you would reach out to if you had any issues with IMAP and they're all super great. The organization, if you are part of a land trust, um, you might be able to access the organization feature um, or if you're part of a lake association, you might have access to that. Um, if not, you'll just be an IMAP member, which you can enter and view and export presence and not detected records. And you can view, but you can't enter treatments um, and you can create personal projects. So even if you're not type of an organ, if you're not part of an organization, you can still create a project um, so that you can, you know, work together as a group, maybe on surveying for Hemlock Willie Adelgid or um, looking for a spotted lanternfly, whatever it might be. So there's two parts of IMAP Invasives. There's the web-based and there's the mobile app. The mobile app is the easiest to use. And most of the time when you're looking for invasive species, unless you're looking from like your window or something, um, you're gonna be using the app because you'll be outside. Um, but you can also access the web one. It's a little bit more cumbersome, um, but if you want to get some more in-depth data, the um, web version is a little bit um, more robust. If you use the web version, you will need to be connected to the internet. Um, but with a mobile app, it's really great because you don't need to be connected to the internet when you're collecting data just to actually upload the data. Um, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you can always use the web, verse, um, web version too on your smartphone if you're connected to the internet. So we can go create an IMAP Invasives account if you all haven't created one already. Um, so I'll share that screen with you all. So basically you would go to imapinvasives.org and you would click login. And it should pull up. I guess my internet's being slow right now but it will pull up a little login screen. And then you can either sign up or you can log in. I already have an account, so I don't have to sign up, but it's really easy. Um, 
like it says it's free and you just enter your name, your email, create a password, and then just select your jurisdiction, which for us is New York State. So you just type in New York, pop it up, and that's really all the information you need. It's not a very um, lengthy process. Um, even if you're like, I'm only going to use the mobile app, you will still have to go to imapinvasives.org to actually sign up and create your account. So that's kind of the first step. So um, I go back to my PowerPoint. If you haven't done that already um, or you're having any issues creating an account, let me know. And then yes, check your email just to make sure it's been activated and you click on the activation link. So this is IMAP Invasives online. I'm gonna go through the mobile app first though, I think just because it's a little bit easier and I'm guessing that's what you'll really use. So again, this is the login page if you are logging in or creating an account, um, but I'm gonna try to share my smartphone again so you guys can see the app. And hopefully this will work. Give me one second. Okay, so you all should be seeing my phone. Let me know if you're not seeing my phone. Um, so the IMAP app, which you can download at the um, app store, or I always forget what the Android version is, maybe the Google store, Google Play store. I don't know. <laughs> I've always had an iPhone, so I have no idea, but um, it looks like this little um, insect. I'm not sure exactly what it is, and a leaf. You click on that, and it'll open up the app. Um, it's really easy to find too, like when you type in IMAP Invasives and whatever store you have to download your apps. It's always the first one that comes up for me with an iPhone. Um, I don't know about anyone using an Android phone, but um, from what I heard, most people can find it pretty easily. And it'll pop up the kind of direction so you can kind of learn where everything is. You can just tap that to make them go away. And then I always go into this um, three lines at the top and actually um, look at my preferences and make sure that's all set up. So you can have your jurisdiction species list, make sure it's set to New York. Um, make sure your email and password map uh, uh, match the one that you originally created. And you want to make sure you click retrieve IMAP list so you can download all the lists when you first open up the app. And then you can kind of customize all the settings. So I have mine set to do the common name because I don't know the scientific name for many invasives. You can create a customized species list. So I have um, my own custom list just to make it easier for when I'm doing trainings for work. So you can have a fake species for testing. I like to use that just to kind of play around with it. And um, then you can go through and check kind of any other invasive that you want to add and that'll all go into a custom list for you. So if you don't want to have to scroll through this long list every time you're looking to um, report an invasive species, you can create your own list. So I think the only other thing I have checked in here is hemlock lily adelgid. Yeah. And then picture quality, you want to make sure it's 100%. If you're having issues with um, your photo is not uploading, you can lower the picture quality, but 100% um, is best for whoever is going to be um, actually, you know, confirming the data, whether they're from the DEC or another one of the partner organizations. It's just kind of easier for them if the picture is a really good quality. Um, you can check if you want your photos to be saved to your photo library and your phone, or if you'd um, rather not have that happen. You can pick what the default base map you'll see is. Um, I prefer the road. Usually it's just a little easier to see where you're at. Um, the default map zoom is usually 12. I must have hit that with my finger <laughs> earlier. 
Um, but you can change how zoomed in you want the map to be. You can pick um, US or metric system. And then you can pick a project if you have a project. So I think I have two. I have Hemlock Boy Adelgid and the Watercraft Stewards. Um, and then my organization is CCE, but you could be a part of a land trust or you might not have an organization either. And then you can check if you want the welcome instructions that popped up when you first opened the app to show up every time, or if you don't wanna see those again after your first time. Um, so those are kind of the key things to do when you first log in. Um, and then to actually upload data, you're just going to click add observation. Um, and then you're going to either take a photo using your camera or you're going to select a photo that you already uploaded. And we'll talk about photos a little bit later. Um, if you check custom list, it'll show just your custom list. So I only have a fake species and I'm luckily adulted. But if you uncheck that, it'll show me every single invasive that's part of the New York jurisdiction. So I always do a fake species for testing and you can check whether it was detected or not detected. So we'll pretend that we found something. You wanna make sure your date is correct. So you want it to say whatever date you're out surveying. Um, the GPS, if that's checked, it'll automatically upload where you are or track your lo uh, location. You can choose a road base map or satellite base map if you wanna change it, if it's easier depending on what you might be surveying for. And you wanna make sure that there's uh, coordinates in the longitude and latitude section, just so that um, there's actually data there. And then you can zoom in the map and kind of see and make sure that the location looks correct. So I'm in my apartment, so you guys can see I live right across from a park in the university area of Syracuse. Um, and then the project, you can tap on that if you wanna change that or if you have multiple organizations that you're a part of. Um, this data is really important for the people who are confirming it. So you should always put the time that you searched. Um, they wanna know if you just did a quick glance, you know, like I was just walking along a trail looking for 10 minutes. It wasn't very extensive. Or if you're like, I spent an hour and a half searching this, you know, acre or whatever, um, looking for hemlock trees and hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, you then click on the size of the area, so how much you search, so maybe you did up to an acre, and then distribution, so this is what shows up for plants, did you find one single plant or a small clump, did you kind of find scattered clumps of plants, did you find dense or a monoculture, um, or did you find them scattered along a road or trail, so you kind of um, click on which one. So maybe we'll say we saw sparse um, scattered plants or clumps. And then you wanna add comments. So anything that you think would be helpful for someone who is like, I you know, want to be able to confirm that this data is, is correct, but also might wanna go back to the site. Um, sometimes the DEC might wanna go or another partner might wanna go check out your report of an invasive species and so if you're really thorough and double check the location and all of your information that you put in the observation comments, it just makes it a little easier for them. So you can put in something like along the uh, Three Meadows Trail, which is a trail in a local park here. And you could say, and next to the pond, I found clumps of like tree of heaven. And then you could add any other information that might be helpful for them. And then you would click, well, I'll click save just for the purpose of showing you what it looks like. Um, so then it will pop up with this little yellow box. So that means that you've created a record, but you haven't officially uploaded it or submitted it into the IMAP Invasives um, system yet to be approved. So to do that, you want to go here and you can just click select all or you can tap on the little box. And then you want to click upload selected. But you'll have to do that once you're connected to the internet. So you won't be able to do that when you're outside using the app. 
Um, I'm going to delete selected just because it's not actual data. Um, but that's kind of the basics of using the app. So it's super, super simple, as you guys can see. Um, pretty easy to use and something that's not super cumbersome for when you're out in the field and you're just like, you know, trying to take a walk, but you're like, hey, I see a tree of heaven. I should probably report that. Um, so we went through all of this. These are my backup slides in case sharing my phone <laughs> doesn't work. So we'll skip through all of this. Um, so these are photos. Um, so when you take a photo or upload a photo in IMAP Invasives, it's really important that the picture be really good quality because someone else is going to be confirming it and they're not out there seeing what you're seeing. So if you can take a really good photo, it's super helpful for them. So these are some examples of good photos. Um, so you can kind of fully see it, everything's in focus. Um, this one's really great because it shows the worm in comparison to this person's hand. So you can kind of get a sense of how big it is. Um, you know, it's pretty zoomed in. You're able to clearly see, see what it is. These are examples of not so great photos. Um, so there's, this kind of photo that might be of hemlock oleodelgia, but it looks more like snow, but you're not really sure because there's glare on this little, what I'm guessing is snow, but um, it's very hard to tell because they're very blurry. Um, this one uh, looks like it has hemlock oleodelgia on it, but it's, you know, kind of on this snowy background and again, out of focus. And then again, this one um, super zoomed out and just not in focus at all. Um, so again, this is how you upload them. Just make sure you check them all and upload them when you're connected to the internet. So now I'll talk about the actual um, IMAP Invasives online. So let me see if I can do this online or if I'm gonna have to use the PowerPoint. So I'm gonna log in and hope that this works. Sometimes it's just too slow when I'm in Zoom. So um, I might have to show you all in PowerPoint, but I'm hoping that it'll work. I think it's always a little bit better to see it when you're going live. Um, so this is kind of the main screen that you'll see when you first log in. It's all of these kind of little hexagons with circles in the middle of them. So when you click on home, this will always bring you back to this screen. Um, you can zoom into your location. So this is gonna zoom me in to where I am right now. Um, then you can zoom in or out if you wanna see more of the neighborhood or if I wanted to really zoom in on um, the area and Berry Park. Um, again, if you're looking for preferences and setting up all of that, you go to these three lines over here and you can make sure your jurisdiction species list is correct. Um, you can check out the projects you're a part of, your organization. You can also go to your account. So that's really helpful. So let's see if I can click on this. Um, so this has all of my information. So when I joined, when I lost, logged in, um, and this is kind of where you can make sure all of your information is correct. If you have any issues or you can edit it, if something's showing up incorrect, um, email alerts, you can set email alerts for different things. So I have them set for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and Skinny Atlas. Um, and you can have it set so that you can get an email if your record is the first of uh, that species in an area. You can have it set so that you are getting um, alerts when a record is added um, in a project that you're a part of or an organization that you're a part of. Um, so I have this alert me when a presence record um, I created is the first of its species. 
um, because I wanted to see that. I think that's really interesting or alert me when a record has been updated. So that will let me know if someone changes something. Um, so let's go back to the map. This is another reason I don't like <laughs> the online version is it's a little slow. I think Zoom doesn't help it, but. Um, so that's kind of these buttons on the side. Um, the search button is really cool. You could search for a specific place if you know where you want to look. So maybe I wanted to look at Clark Reservation State Park. I could easily zoom in right to Clark Reservation and check out if I wanted to see kind of what's been reported there. Um, here, let's see, change base maps. You can change again between the topographic and the satellite. Um, here, probably the most important is the layers on and off. So do you wanna see confirmed? Do you wanna see unconfirmed? So people have updated it as I found this invasive species, but it hasn't been confirmed by a certified um, person from the DEC or whoever. Do you wanna see not detected? Do you wanna see areas that's been that have been treated? Do you wanna see where people have searched? So I usually just pull up confirmed and not detected. Sometimes I look at treatments. I know they've been treating hemlock trees in the watershed. And so I wanna kind of see those for work. So I'll look at treatments sometimes, but usually I just see um, confirmed and then not detected is kind of the most helpful. So these little green Buttons. So if you look at the legend, all the confirmed present are these um, green shapes, circles, and other polygons. And then not detected is the um, kind of light yellow. And then if you click on a record, it'll pull up more information about it. So this looks like they were reporting garlic mustard. Um, and you can click on the details and it'll show you more information about what exactly they found. Maybe it'll have a photo. Hopefully it'll have a photo. Um, let's see. Well, let's give that time to load and we'll come back to that. Um, so that's kind of the legend, kind of tells you what you're seeing on the map, what all these different colors mean. Um, another helpful tool is filtering records. So sometimes I like to look for um, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. That's one that is really important to me. So you can click on species um, that you want to see and then click apply filter. And it'll find just the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid um, that have been reported in this area. So that should be, I'm guessing, all of these little dots. Yeah. Um, so that's a really helpful tool. And then kind of the last one that you might use here is creating a record. So again, this one is a little bit more in depth. It's not just a presence or a not detected like it is in the app. You can also put in a treatment or a multi-record if you searched a big area and you wanna kind of put in a bunch of different um, things. So I'm gonna actually go back and do presence. And this again, you can do a point, a line or a polygon, which is different from the app. So you can do more in depth. If you just found one tree, you can enter it as a point if you found a bunch of garlic mustard along a trail, you can put that in as a line, or you can do a polygon if you're like, I found, um, you know, tree of heaven all in this area. And then you can redraw it if it's not correct, you can make edits to it, or you can click next. Choose a species, I'll do a fake species. Make sure your name is correct and the date. And then again, it's kind of similar to the app, just adding a photo, how much you found, um, the percent cover, um, distribution. So again, that's the trace, the sparse, dense, monoculture, or linearly scattered. And then any comments. Um, and then you would click next. And then once it's correct, you would 
make sure that everything looks good and then you would hit complete. Um, so those are kind of the major things for the online. Let me see. So this is what it looks like if you click on one of those dots and pull up more information. It'll show you who the person was, when they observed it, if they were part of an organization, where they're from. Garlic mustard, you can see they took a photo of it. Um, you can click on the photo to get a really good view. The cool thing about the online one is it has a reference photo. So if you're like, hey, this looks like garlic mustard, but I'm not sure I want to compare it to a reference photo, it will have one for you. Um, and then this person put in the abundance. So they looked up to 10 square feet and saw a distribution. So kind of scattered plants or clumps of garlic mustard. And that's usually kind of what you need to, to enter. Number found can be helpful as well as like, as well as notes, but some of this other stuff is a little more in depth, you know, age of woody plants, um, biocontrol species. Some of that's a lot more involved and they definitely don't expect you to up, upload all of that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna stop my share, go back to the PowerPoint really quickly. And we'll skip all of this part to get to the end. So basically, um, if you're in IMAP and you're finding it overwhelming, which my suggestion is just to go into IMAP and just play around with it because it can be a little overwhelming and confusing. And I feel like watching a tutorial is not the same as actually going through and doing it yourself. Um, so, you know, play around with it. And if you have any issues, um, IMAP Invasives um, has a help button. They have lots of, you know, resources where you can find information and tutorials. They have their own um, YouTube series where you can watch um, some of their webinars that they've done on IMAP Invasives. And they're also like the nicest people ever. So I encourage you to reach out to them. They've always been super helpful when I've ever I've had any questions. Um, and I want to quickly talk about volunteer opportunities um, using IMAP Invasive. So in central New York, there's a local group, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Hunters, that's actually run by Steve Kinney, who's a master naturalist. And he goes out and he's done a lot of surveying for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed and um, surrounding areas of central New York. Um, your local prism. So in the Finger Lakes, we have a macrophyte survey program that's done every summer, a trail survey program they do as well. And then they'll do periodic uh, water chestnut pulls. So if you're interested in actually going out on a boat and pulling water chestnut out of one of the local Finger Lakes, you can join that. Um, boat stewards are throughout the entire state. Um, that's a really great way to get involved. And then there's the IMAP and SLF um, volunteer opportunities. So um, if you go to the IMAP website, it has more information on this, but you can basically claim your own little grid square um, for somewhere, maybe it's um, near your house or in a place that you like to visit a lot outdoors. Um, and you can claim that grid square as your own and just have to periodically kind of check it for Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. Um, and they have kind of information on their website with a webinar series that you can watch the recordings of if you want to find out more information. Um, but the website has a lot of great information about it and you can always reach out to them if you're interested. Basically, they've mapped New York State and kind of identified high priority areas and they've created grids based on that. So you can just kind of look locally and see which squares haven't been claimed near you and, and claim one if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I just wanted, kind of wanted to end, in, end on a group discussion, question answer session, talking about invasives and how frustrating they can be. Maybe you manage invasive species um, on a property or you have them on your, um, you know, in your backyard and you're kind of managing them. Um, or if you wanna talk about ways that you think IMAP invasives could be used for master naturalist um, hours and volunteering. So yeah, just kind of wanted to end with a group discussion with all of my fellow master naturalists. So I'll stop sharing now and see 
Yeah, Thank you, questions? Camille. Yeah. Oh, um, looks like Dave and Lori have a, a question. They asked, um, after it's uh, uploaded, where do you find the invasive that you reported? Yeah, so you can um, you can find your own records. So the easiest way to do this is to um, go to the web version and you can actually, there's a way that you can search records. Um, so not just filtering records, um, you could filter records by your name as an observer, or you could um, actually search records for your name as well. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. Or you can sign up to get an, an email alert. So when someone has confirmed your invasive species, you'll get an email about it saying like, hey, this has been confirmed by so-and-so from the DEC or land trust. So it really depends on what you want to do in IMAP Invasives, if you want to get emails from them or not. Um, but you can always go back and search for your own observations, too. Thank you, Camille. Yeah, no problem. Um, if anybody else has questions, feel free to type them in the chat or if you want to unmute and ask, you're welcome to do that, too. Um, Camille, I had a question and looking at the map across the U.S., there, there are clusters. Is that because only those states are promoting it or is it only available for people in those states or why are the, they're the big blank spots? Yeah, so I'm up invasives is only used by certain states and um, I think some territories or portions of Canada. Um, there are other states using different software and apps that are out there to track I'm at, or uh, invasive species. Um, so it's kind of funny because you'd think we'd have one uh, app or database for the entire country, but no, it's just kind of whatever the state has decided to use. So New York decided to go with I'm Up Invasives, but, you know, in the South, they use um, a different app. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but a, a bunch of states in the South use a different, different tool. So yeah, you can't really kind of compare Within IMAP invasives, you can't really look at too many other other states, unfortunately. Yeah, interesting. I I was curious because I know there are some master naturalist volunteers who live in New York part of the year and other states other times of the year. So. Okay. Yeah, that would be tricky. Yeah, they wouldn't really, depending on what state they live in, they wouldn't be able to use IMAP in their their other home state. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Any recent experiences with an invasive in your area? I was curious for the Finger Lakes uh, list that you posted, there was beach leaf disease and I hadn't heard of that. I'm not too familiar with it either. Um, personally, I know my coworker Christina does a lot more with um, those kind of invasive species being our forestry specialist. So I kind of focus more mostly on the aquatic invasives and ones that might have um, really bad impacts on our water quality, like hemlock bully adelgid. Oh, I see something else. Is it useful to use IMAP invasives on your property? Absolutely. Yes, looking for gypsy moths. Yes, garlic mustard, all of that is great to, to report. Um, the more data the state has, the better. Um, they actually, so this is a story of someone who used IMAP invasives that I think is really um, compelling. Someone from Long Island had a summer home in the Adirondacks on Lake George, and they happened to, you know, they were very familiar with hemlock bully adelgid because it's all throughout Long Island in the southern portion of New York. And they saw trees that were infected by hemlock bully adelgid in, uh, around Lake George. And they um, put that data and time map invasives. And the state actually tracks um, certain species that are like high priority. And so they saw that report come in and they immediately created a plan for treating those hemlock trees. So the data that you put in, whether it's in your backyard or wherever, wherever it is, can have a really, really important impact on how we manage invasive species. So I always think that's a great story, like someone who just happened to be at their summer home and 
yeah, and other state is is helping to hopefully eradicate homophily adulted from the Adirondacks. Does anyone use IMAP invasives for volunteering or anything that they do as a master naturalist? Matt and Linda are raising their hands and Carmen. Awesome. What do you use it for, Carmen? Uh, I have a couple plots that I signed up for in a local park just, you know, just right down the street from me um, for uh, Lanternfly and um, Tree of Heaven. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, I, I I just need to use I need to use the app a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit clunky for me, um, and it's just because I haven't used it enough. Um, and also, the other part is there, there are just so many invasives. Um, I would love to try to list them all, but it is um, it's a bit overwhelming. Plus, I don't know my plants nearly as well as you guys do, um, so it sort of is my impetus to to become a little bit more knowledgeable with what the heck is out there in my parks. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like it is so overwhelming. I'm constantly learning about new invasive species that I didn't even know about. And so I kind of have picked a couple that I know I can identify and I feel really confident with like garlic mustard, water chestnut. And I'm like, these are the ones that I'm gonna focus on. If I'm in the woods and I see something that I think might be an invasive, but I'm not sure, like, you know, I'm just kind of taking a walk in the woods. I won't always go out of my way to like, obsessively identify it and try to go through all of that. But if I see something that I know, like, you know, water chestnut along the Hudson River when I'm visiting my parents, I'll be like, okay, I know that's water chestnut. I can report that easy. So I kind of say pick a couple that are, you know, like you did, like pick, you know, tree of heaven and spot on lanternfly and go for those versus, I mean, yeah, there's how many, like the list of species just in New York is insane. So yeah, we definitely can't all do every single species, so. Okay. Matthew and Linda, what about you? What do you use IMAP invasives for? Well, we've used it pretty extensively in our preserve and in the surrounding Jadwin forest, which is like a 20,000 acre forest uh, for hemlock, woolly, adelage. And that seems to be what our Prism is primarily asking for folks to do. Uh, you know, that's probably their number one target. So we haven't used it on other things. We've used it very extensively, though, for uh, for the hemlock for hemlock forest. So maybe maybe we'll branch out. Maybe we're inspired by you, Camille. Thank you. Yay! I love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why I pointed out the ones to watch list because that's a great list. You can go look at the top 10 or so species in your region and kind of see, you know, pick one or two of those that you're like, I'm going to focus on these. And then those are high priorities for your region of the state. So it's kind of, you know, relevant to you locally, but it's also not, you know, hundreds of species that you're feeling overwhelmed with. I think that's part of what makes IMAP invasives a little overwhelming is just um, usually when you're out in the woods, you're kind of relaxing, um, you know, not really thinking about uploading data or, yeah, just where, where to start with invasive. So the ones to watch can be a great one to check out. And I was just Google DECs ones to watch and, and find it that way. But if anyone has any issues locating it, I can always send you the link too. Yeah, that was cool. I, I just did a real quick Google search on the um, the beach leaf disease and it just said something about a couple of different sites, including DEC, but it's called by a nematode and it causes this um, dark banding in the leaves and basically messes up the vascular system. But I couldn't find anywhere about where this came from originally. So anyway, these hmm. things are, are amazing. I mean, I was looking at that list too and I'm like, is there anything native left? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy long. Oh yeah, and the, like I probably know maybe like you know ten percent of the ones on that list. It's so crazy how many, yeah. you know, I haven't heard of. And yeah, I see another comment. It was interesting that Emerald Ashbor wasn't on the ones to watch. I think that's because 
um, at least here in Syracuse. We know it's here. It's destroyed. It's killed so many of the ash trees. And they just, I think at this point, they're like, we know it's here. We're not really looking for it. There's not really much we can do. So I'm guessing that's why it's not on the ones to watch. Um, it's just, it's, it's too far gone here in, in Onondaga County. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Camille. Thank you for for stepping up to do this one tonight. And thank you everyone for joining. It's great to see so many of the, the new group here tonight and, um, and everyone, all of you who regularly participate as well. So I hope you're all enjoying the fall and um, we have our next one coming up in two weeks and I'm looking forward to that as well. And uh, so I hope you all have a nice, uh, nice evening. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Camille, well done. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.